What's the one thing that you think you've done that's been the most positive? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to come at this from a completely different angle because uh, I suppose the one thing that I did that was positive was to to come up with an idea, <laughs> and and then and then talk about it online. So I I think just coming off the back of your uh, comment, Inga, the the thing that the thing that I like doing online that I find the most positive is putting a half baked idea out there and then having a discussion about it. And I think that that can suddenly kind of open up your approach to engaging online because the, you know we're we're trained throughout school and university generally to work on on something until it's finished and then only show the world when when we've finished it quite often you don't show the world you just show your tutor um, whereas i think that the, the the real you know interesting aspect of the way that online networks can work and i and i'm talking about you know this kind of engaging with others is our, the opportunity to, to, to be part of a flow of discourse, you know, and the opportunity to kind of push knowledge forwards. So for me, you know, the, 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 that's the most positive aspect of it, and that's the thing that I, en I enjoy the most, is the idea that I can, put an, I, I can put one of my notions out into the world and with the help of others develop it, evolve it, and see it travel. So I'm sort of so less... That's yeah, really yeah really at odds to how we're taught to think about our knowledge and our ideas. You know, it's all about the citation. It's all about making the claim. It's all about, you know, sticking a name on something and making sure you are first and, and not getting scooped. And, of course, that anxiety is very, very present in PhD students. What's your response to that? Because um, what, you, what you're saying actually takes a lot of courage and goes against um, some cult cultural well, norms. Well, one, one of the things that's, that helps, I think, is that I didn't do a PhD. So I wasn't trained in that way of thinking. So in that sense, I don't have an academic career, and yet here I find myself. So and I so I I consider myself to be somebody who's kind of travelling almost entirely by a different route, whereby I'm more interested in expressing ideas and, as I say, moving knowledge forwards in in those online spaces and, and places. Now, what I'd say coming back on your question, and and I'm I'm very confident about this, is that some people think, well, if you blog an idea, you're giving it away. My experience is if you blog an idea, you're actually claiming it for yourself. And I've never had any problem that I know of with people stealing my ideas. Now that is partly because my like career path, if we're talking in that sense, is not tied to classic institutional structures. Uh, and so I don't have to worry about that quite so much. But I, I recommend to anybody out there, you know, to start putting your ideas out into the world via the digital because it's a place where you can actually develop those ideas. The, you know, that principle of, of, of being in your, your own little sort of room and working up an idea until you completely own it and then putting it out there is, I think, just really not fun, you know. And I don't <laughs> I think, think, I don't think it's... I don't think it's yeah, well, maybe. I just don't think that's part of what university should be about. You know, I don't think that's yeah. our remit. So, I'll okay. stop there. <laughs> no, it's a good answer, David. And, um, and yes, but I, uh, there's some areas of, of the university where that, that argument is, finds it very hard to find traction. Anyway, I'll leave that one behind because, obviously, I have issues. Um, but what about you, Andy? What's the most positive thing you think you've either made or done or put on the web that you think's got you the most positive interest? Well, I say I'm going to agree. I say I'm going to agree with David just to make a point that that one of the issues I come across by you know dealing with with researchers and and PhD students and master students is this fear of failure, and the fear of that they don't feel that they can say things that they are actually experts in and. Um, I've I've kind of run workshops where I've kind of asked people to search for stuff on each other on the web to find out what's out there. These are people who are not using social media, finding interviews with themselves on such as even SoundCloud and things like that. And what I try and express to them is, if you're happy for someone from the Guardian to ring you up or 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 someone to interview for some blog or some magazine and you'll speak there as the expert, why can't you take control of that message yourself? and push it out there and we we don't see that because it is a fear of failure it's a fear of well I'm not entirely sure whether I can say this so I mean what I try and do is try and kind of practice what I preach so you know I, I try and pitch blog articles and 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 try and get bits of evidence to show academics that there's another way so a recent example was I wrote something 
for the LSC uh, Impact blog, which is an excellent blog for anyone interested in this area to follow the impact of social sciences. And I wrote a two-piece article on post-publication review, which is a big issue these days because again it falls into this area what can I say publicly can I say this can I say that we're, where we're seeing academics now commenting post publication on other people's research and we'd like to think it's all very measured and very balanced and it's a critical response um, so I, I, I wrote about the various tools available and the implications to this and I got a, an email a few weeks later from a journal editor a, pro, a professor from New Zealand asking whether I would write something for a special issue on open access for his peer review journal. So there we see all flipped on its head. You know, I've, I've written these informal pieces for a blog. I've pitched them. Someone from the other side of the world has contacted me, said I find these very interesting, and will you write me a journal article? So there's an invited journal article. That's great. First person I told was our director of research, who was impressed. You know, something for him, for a professor, not a big impact really. He will be invited to do things all the time. But for me or people of my light, that's that's quite a big step forward, I think. And it shows that this the social media and these elements such as blogging can kind of get you in the back door. It gets you heard because if you're not engaging, if you're not having the conversation, then no one's hearing you and you, you don't exist in their eye line. And I think it's about bringing you into people's eye lines that you do know about a particular topic and, and it's really interesting that you're saying so both of you I mean are talking about basically just extending what you would normally do as an academic into these online spaces um, in maybe tentative ways or unfinished ways so yeah. it's challenging already that that notion that somehow social media sits aside or separate to everything else you do as an academic so thank you for that, Andy. How about you, Jenny? Sorry, yeah. Andy. Yeah. Go, Jenny. <laughs> um, I think my, my key thing is if you're going to blog, you need to be authentic and you need to be open. And I've got similar stories to what we've heard already of where a blog post where I've written something about what I'm interested in, what I'm investigating, and how I'm investigating it has led to somebody tweeting at me <laughs> saying, can we get in touch? Because he's also interested in the same areas. And then we've been co-authors on a paper. You know, I'm a librarian. I'm not really an academic, but I'm still an author on a paper because of my digital media presence. And uh, similarly, I co-authored a chapter in a book. I went to the book launch and um, met some of the other authors from that book and now we have a one of the other authors and myself, we have a, a blog conversation going so it's gone from the the face-to-face -face and traditional route into digital and then it's gone the other way for me as well. So if you're authentic and you're open um, and you, you maintain those connections that you make and sometimes you know it can take a long time so the author I met, the co-author from the book, that was over a year before we got back in touch and we just sort of reflected on the things that we'd talked about when we met face to face and um, yeah, being open and authentic so, and, and keeping in touch. So Jenny, it's interesting and, and, and speaking as a woman, I often get asked, you know, do you get trolled a lot? Because that's that's the discourse that we, we hear, especially through the conventional media, is that, oh, be careful of the internet, it's a big scary place, you're going to get trolled. Has that happened to you? Never, never. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm inviting it now, but I, I mean, my experience has been overwhelmingly positive. So yeah, I can't share anything yeah. on that. Yeah, I've I've had my fair share of them. I've just learnt to um, strategically ignore them. But I think it's very helpful that my avatar isn't gendered, and I've been very careful to sort of keep my face out of most of my feeds. I think that's actually been helpful because the bigger you get. Uh, the more opportunities that you have for people to troll you. And I suppose maybe I ask for it a little bit when I do posts like academic assholes in the circle of niceness. So I'll leave that <laughs> I'll leave that where it where it sits. How about you, Mike? What's the one, you know, single most positive thing that you think you've done um, for your career with social media? Yeah, well my career's been relatively quite short in comparison with most on the panel, but um, really kind of just to reiterate, putting the putting your work out there, putting the hook out and hoping that kind of a fishy will bite is is obviously kind of the most important um, aspect of using social media, just getting your research out there, dissemination, right? That That's probably the main thing. But I also want to kind of look at it from a very different route. So, and I want to use a kind of an anecdote from my research. So I mentioned earlier that social networks can be really useful for accessing closed communities, 
and difficult to engage with kind of institutions like the government, non-governmental departments and stuff like that. Um, for my research, I, um, I worked with uh, two communities um, in uh, East London that were part of my case study. Um, I had a really good following around them and they'll be hopefully following me now. Um, and I needed to get access to the mayor's office. Um, I sent them email after email and uh, I didn't get much of a response. However, when I tweeted them, their institutional profile, um, this was then amplified by my network, the constituents that they were representing, and they amplified my message. Um, so on one side, it's kind of almost like a really good like political lobbying tool for getting people who would not normally speak to speak with you. And, and that's a really important, particularly when you're doing quite kind of politically and economically orientated subjects, and, and that can be quite contentious, like looking at the economic impacts of of mega events, big spe uh, kind of macro spectacles, it's it's sometimes very difficult to get people to speak to you. So that's that's kind of one thing, and, and and that kind of then branches out to you know institutional importance of kind of the ref uh, uh, and research impact, and it's about kind of it's about connecting with your people, especially as social scientists. You're but you need to connect with your people, get their views, get their backing. Um, which can then, because I, I sit within the field of, of critical theory, um, which requires some modes of social action um, and emancipation for certain communities who are being affected by whatever I'm looking at. Um, and, and through access with these uh, governmental organizations, through these organizations, um, you, you, can, you can subtly influence policy. Um, and, and, and practice and get your get your research out there on a on a kind of a, a, an important leveraging uh, platform like like these institutions. So, for example, I'm working with the Federation of Small Business on a next part of my research survey um, without a, a, a social media presence and getting through uh, a discussion and, and communicating with them via social media. That would have never, never, never happened. But now we're kind of co-branding a study together, which is huge. And we've got the government involved. We've got, you know, the Confederation for British Industry involved. And w w without that that access to those relatively quite closed communities, um, uh, the research would never been able to invoke one at such a wide dissemination of research and to um, push forward the kind of the social action and critical theory that's required for taking the, those types of kind of theoretical approaches. And it's underpinned by the fact that kind of places like Twitter, forums like Twitter, really give um, hard-faced institutions a, a public and personal persona. And I think that, that, underpins, that underpins it, in my perspective, my opinion. Thank, yeah. thank you, Michael. It's really, um, really interesting thinking about political action, particularly because Twitter and other social media sites have been implicated in revolutions. Mm, so yeah. maybe it's Viva the Academic Revolution. Um, I'll add my last one to that. Apart from the fact that I, I credit Twitter with my current job, which um, is a great job and enabled me to move into state and work in one of the best universities in the country, which is fantastic. The other th really positive thing that has happened to me is I wrote a paper with uh, Pat Thompson called Why Do Academics Blog? And it's become, I think at the moment, it's the third most read paper ever in studies in higher education, which is a fairly prestigious journal. And Pat and I have been um, both amused and amazed at the, the, the speed that it travelled up that ranking table. I think the one that's ahead of it at the moment has been, you know, seven years it's taken to get to that, to that level and we're just behind it and it's only been out for 18 months. So I think that... Um, what what social media can do is actually amplify your conventional research metrics because uh, because marketing an academic paper is a little bit of a niche marketing prospect. There's only a certain number of people in the world that are going to be interested in what it is that you're saying. And I think everyone here has spoken about entering those communities, being part of those communities. Those communities are the audience and consumers of your work, as we know, and um, and that then has this effect on those conventional counting metrics because um, I know for one I can't make my blog count in any of our research impact systems here that we have in Australia. Maybe in the UK it would be different. 